Hey, everybody, welcome back to the Michael Lofton Show here on Reason and Theology. I want to talk about the question of public dissent in light of um, some things that the German bishops said back in 1967, as well as some comments that Carl, Carl Rahner made, very, uh, <laughs> very um, controversial figure who uh, was certainly not a... Um, traditionalist in, in many ways. Um, <clears throat> I want to look at some of the comments that he makes about uh, public dissent, again, in light of this document from the German bishops. Many of you may already know that I'm doing my um, doctoral dissertation on the question of the magisterium, and the focus is on the question of non-definitive teachings of the magisterium, so what we would call non-infallible teachings. So acts of the teaching authority of the church, the magisterium, that are authoritative, that are binding on the conscience, but do not necessarily, um, you know, exercise the... Um, the charism of infallibility. So the teaching itself might not be free from all air. Um, I've been intrigued by this topic for years now because I just see so much application um, in apologetic circles, you know, controversies and dialogue with Eastern Orthodox Protestants and even other Catholics. The question of uh, can the magisterium teach air constantly comes up and so I've been fascinated with studying the magisterium. Um, in what instances does it teach infallibly? In what instances is it teaching non-infallibly? What is the extent that the magisterium can err? Um, what do you do if the magisterium teaches two separate things? You know, to which one do you owe your assent? What are the various levels of assent to the different acts, teaching acts of the magisterium? You know, all of these questions I've just been fascinated by uh, for years. And I noticed that there was a lacuna here. There isn't a whole lot of, um, there aren't a whole lot of people out there who really address these questions um, and have an expertise in the magisterium, not people who are alive still. Um, unfortunately, many of the people who uh, were experts in this area are no longer alive. There are, there are still some experts on the magisterium, don't get me wrong, but it's something that we need more of. And there's just not a whole lot of awareness on this topic. So again, I've been fascinated by it. And I, you know, one of the questions I had to consider was, okay, where is the first time in history, in church history, that we really encounter the notion that the church can teach error whenever it teaches non-definitively? Like where, where does this claim come from? Where do we find it explicitly you know, mentioned in church history. Um, oddly enough, it though it's implied in previous centuries, the first time this was brought up explicitly, to my knowledge, and the knowledge of most people who are experts in the area, is 1967. So very recently. There's a lot of reasons for this. Perhaps we can get into them another time. Um, but we don't have a whole lot of uh, discussions about the magisterium's non-definitive teachings and its ability to teach non-definitively um, in church history, let alone discussions of the extent to which it can or cannot err. There just isn't a lot. But the first time we see it brought up, at least explicitly, 1967, by German bishops. Now, keep in mind, these are some of the German bishops, or at least it was the German bishops, um, you know, a few years later, um, who in large part rejected Humanae Vitae and its teachings on artificial contraception. Uh, but just several years before that, you have a semi-private document circulating among the German bishops. So it was not necessarily something publicly available. And to this day, it's pretty hard to get a copy of this document that was in circulation. Now, I can point you to two resources where you can find an English translation of the document. Uh, number one, 
by a figure who's himself very controversial, a dissenting figure uh, who was censored by the Catholic Church and the Magisterium. Uh, Charles Curran compiled this work, um, The Magisterium and Morality. And in one of these, he has an essay contribution by Karl Rahner, also a controversial figure. Um, you can find a copy of what the German uh, document says in English in its entirety. That, well, at least the relevant portions. You can find it there. And I think this thing is pretty cheap on Amazon. Uh, or in Karl Rahner's uh, volume 14 of his theological investigations it's the exact same essay that is um found in curran's work so whichever one is cheaper either volume 14 of the theological investigations or this one you can find a copy of the relevant portions that uh Rahner makes available in english um unfortunately that's really those are the only places that you can find it but i'm going to review just a couple parts from it I think I've read the whole document in a previous stream, but I want to touch on a couple additional points. Um, let's go to the document itself. I'm looking at page 115 of my edition of Curran's work here. And this, uh, I'm going to start around paragraph 18 of the German document because it talks about um, the magisterium and whether or not it can teach air. And then it touches on the question of public dissent from the magisterium. Public dissent. Something very timely today. <laughs> Again, also very interesting given that it's coming from Germany uh, <laughs> in light of not only German bishops dissenting against Humanae Vitae just a couple years later, but also problems with Germany even today with uh, dissent against the magisterium. What is going on with Germany and, and dissent? I, I don't know, but <laughs> shout out to the faithful Catholic Germans who are watching the show. I'm not talking about you. <laughs> uh, okay. So it says this, this is again from the German bishops. Now let us consider the possibility or the fact, notice that, of error and non-defined statements of doctrine on the part of the church. Right there, the first time we really see this brought up explicitly in church history. Recognizing that these themselves in turn may differ uh, very widely among themselves in the degree of binding force. So non-definitive teachings can vary in degree in, in, in their binding force, which Lumen Gentium 25 states uh, the same. The first point to be recognized resolutely and realistically is that human life, even at a wholly general level, must always be lived by doing one's best according to one's lights and by recognized principles, which, while at the theoretical level they cannot be recognized as absolutely certain, nevertheless command our respect in the here and now as valid norms of thinking and acting because in the existing circumstances they are the best that can be found. It gives you a practical example of this. It says, this is something that everyone recognizes from the concrete experience of one's own life. Every doctor in his diagnoses, every statesman in the political judgments he arrives at on particular situations, and the decisions he bases on these is aware of this fact. So, you know, if you're a medical doctor, you know that your medical evaluation is not infallible. Um, but you do recognize it's informed. And we often have to live in a situation where we make judgments every day, knowing that our judgments are not infallible. They may not be free from error, but they're certainly, they tend to be informed judgments, uh, especially when we make a judgment based on our expertise. Um, so we know that we kind of operate in this middle instance and that the same is true of the magisterium the magisterium doesn't always offer an infallible intervention but just because it's not offering something infallible doesn't mean that it's not still speaking from its competency um and uh, authoritatively with good arguments that's well researched uh 
That's kind of what's being said here. The church, too, in its doctrine and practice cannot always, and in every case, allow itself to be caught in the dilemma of either arriving at a doctrinal decision which is ultimately binding, or simply being silent and leaving everything to the free opinion of the individual. So in other words, the magisterium cannot operate with this either or. Either we get ready to, you know, either we infallibly teach this doctrine, or we just are silent on the question. That's just practically not very helpful. Um, you know, the magisterium often operates kind of in the middle there, where it's not going to allow silence, it's going to intervene, but it might not be ready to speak infallibly on the subject yet. So it kind of has to offer that middle position where it offers a judgment that's authoritative, but it's a non-infallible judgment. It doesn't mean that the judgment is in error, it just means that it could be in error. And it's better than just not saying anything at all, or the other extreme of don't say anything until you're ready to just infallibly teach. If the church were limited in its options to those two options of either don't say anything at all or only speak infallibly, you just wouldn't have a whole lot of interventions from the magisterium. Um, so it continues, in order to maintain the true and ultimate substance of faith, it must, even at the risk of error in points of detail, give expression to doctrinal directives which have certain degree of binding force, and yet since they are not de fide definitions, another term in this context, they're just referring to infallible definition, involve a certain element of the provisional, even to the point of being capable of including error. So the church might need to intervene, but it knows it's not necessarily offering an infallible intervention, and that could be, it could be something that includes error in some of the finer details. Now it says, otherwise it would be quite impossible for the church to preach or interpret its faith as a decisive force in real life, or to apply it to each new situation in human life as it arises. In such cases, the position of the individual Christian in regard to the church is analogous to that of a man who knows that he is bound to accept the decisions of a specialist, even while recognizing that it is not infallible. Oh, I love that. Um, because is, is it that applicable to, to us today? You go to a medical doctor, you know your doctor is not necessarily infallible in his medical evaluations, but you do trust, hopefully, uh, you trust the competency of your doctor. And you're probably, hopefully, not second guessing every little thing that he says. I hope you're not one of those. Uh, that doesn't mean that you can't get a second opinion. Uh, that doesn't mean you can't question some things. Of course you can and should, but... Obviously, you should respect and defer to an expert's opinion um, in the majority of instances, right? And that's how we are with medical doctors. Now, could you imagine a second guessing every little tiny thing? And, okay, well, my doctor gave me th this, and it's based on this particular um, medical, uh, medical information. Now, let me go and get a nursing textbook or a medical textbook and go and fact check my doctor here on this. And it's like, Look, I, I don't know if you're in the position to do that, you know, as a layman who hasn't really studied uh, medicine to the extent of a doctor. So it would probably be disastrous for one to do that. Um, and you'll probably end up coming away with some wild and wacky conclusions. So in the same way, we know, you know, that's probably not a very wise thing to do. We do need to rely on the experts to an extent. Um Likewise, it is with the church, right? Uh, we recognize that, you know, bishops or theologians, generally speaking, are more competent to weigh in on the subject than a person who's not trained in theology. Generally, there's exceptions. Um, <clears throat> now, it continues at any rate. And by the way, isn't that so different than what we have today? We recognize that with the medical field, but we don't recognize that with the magisterium. So we second guess everything that the Pope says. 
or that the Pope teaches or every magisterial document or intervention. We second guess it and we scrutinize it. We say, yeah, the Pope was wrong about this. And yeah, Vatican II was wrong about this. And uh, armchair theologians with very little formal training in theology or training at all in theology, um, you know, sitting in judgment of the magisterium to the extreme of accusing it of error. Um, it's almost comical how arrogant and prideful we can be. Um, and we don't do this in other areas of life. Hopefully, uh, <laughs> hopefully we're not doing this in other areas of life. Okay. So it continues at any rate, any opinion which runs contrary to a current statement on of doctrine on the part of the church has no place in preaching or catechesis. Ooh. Oof. When the German bishops are more traditional than many trads out there, there's a problem. <laughs> I'm just saying. Again, and this is ironic given um, it was largely Germany who started to dissent against Humanae Vitae. But obviously the person who wrote this document in Germany was not of that perspective and was trying to um, address some of this dissent that was stirring up in Germany already. Um, so it notes that, you know, teaching something contrary to what the church teaches, even if the church is only teaching it infallibly, it, that has no place in preaching or catechesis. And yet, isn't that what we're doing today? Aren't people who claim to be traditional doing just that? Um, aren't some traditional priests or catechists doing just that? Um, again, people who claim to be traditional, I would say they're more pseudo traditionalists because that's not traditional. Um, but dissenting against the magisterium, constantly questioning, second guessing everything it says, or even teaching contrary to what the magisterium teaches under the guise of, I'm just being faithful to what the magisterium taught before. Um, ironically is the same era of Martin Luther. Um, and it is very problematic. And here the German bishops are cautioning us against that. Or at least the people behind this document in Germany were cautioning us against that. Uh, it continues. Again, at any rate, any opinion which runs contrary to a current statement or doctrine on the part of the church has no place in preaching or catechesis, even though the faithful may under certain circumstances have to be instructed as to the nature of and the limited weight to be attached to a current doctrinal decision of this kind. So yeah, you can give catechesis to a person and let them know, yeah, this teaching may not necessarily be infallible or may be pretty low on the spectrum of authority, but that doesn't give you license to publicly dissent. Um, <clears throat> it continues, this is a point which has already been discussed. Anyone who believes that he is justified in holding as a matter of his own private opinion, that he has already even now arrived at some better insight which the church will come to in the future, must ask himself in all sober self-criticism before God and his conscience, whether he has the necessary breadth and depth of specialized theological knowledge to permit himself in his private theory and practice to depart from the current teaching of the official church. Oh, goodness. <laughs> wow. Um, okay. Yeah. So <laughs> this document from Germany is saying, okay, you want to dis you want to depart from what the church teaches, even though it's teaching it non infallibly. Okay. Let's tease that out for a moment. Are you really sure that you have the necessary theological training and you have enough, enough breadth and depth in your theological insight to know better than the magisterium of the church and to have figured out that, you know, the magisterium is wrong here and eventually the magisterium is going to realize it's wrong and correct itself? Are you really prepared? to stand before God and say, yeah, I have enough theological training to know the magisterium is wrong at this point. Now, if the answer is yes, then okay, go for it. You can privately do that. That doesn't mean you get to publicly dissent, but in your private conscience, 
uh, you can withhold that assent. Are most of us in that position, though, to really make that judgment? Honestly. Honestly. Are most of us really in that position? We've, we've studied theology and the magisterium so well that we just know what the magisterium is currently teaching on amor satitia or the death penalty or whatever. We just know that it can't be reconciled to what was previously taught. And eventually the church is going to realize it made a mistake and it's going to self-correct. But I get to go ahead and withhold assent from what it's currently teaching because I'm just sure these two things can't be harmonized. And I've spotted the error and I can stand in good conscience before God and give an account and say, yeah, I knew better than the magisterium on this point. Are most of us really in that position? Um, are most of the people who are on social media right now who claim to be Catholic, who claim to be traditional, who are constantly second guessing, questioning everything the magisterium teaches and publicly dissenting from it. Are they, are they really in that position? Well, I can tell you now, m most of the people who are doing it don't have any kind of training in theology, most of them. And the few that do, they certainly don't have enough training in ecclesiology to be doing what they're doing. Uh, let alone to publicly dissent, you know, privately withholding assent per donum veritatis is allowed in very exceptional cases, basically what the German bishops are saying, those cases. This rare case where you happen to know better than the magisterium. Um, but actually publicly dissenting, yeah, I don't see anything in donum veritatis allowing for that. I don't see thing, anything in Canon 212 or anything else that would allow for public dissent against the magisterium. So even if you can make a case that you somehow know better than the magisterium, I don't see where the authority of the church ever allows a person to go in publicly dissent. And when again, when the German bishops are telling you you can't do that, that's a little sobering. It's pretty. It's just interesting to see this. Um, it, it gets interesting, you, you, you know. Even um, with some additional points, I'm going to bring out here. Um, it says such a case is conceivable in principle. That is that you know better than the magisterium. Such a case is conceivable in principle, but subjective presumptuousness and an unwarranted attitude of knowing better will be called to account before the judgment seat of God. Again, when the German bishops are cautioning you against public dissent and saying you're going to have to account, you're going to have to give an account before God for departing from what the magisterium teaches, even when it teaches not infallibly. When the German bishops are warning you of this, Maybe, maybe we've gone too far at this point, you know, maybe we need to let this reality sink in that we've gone really far. Again, these, these are the days of humane vitae, you know, and that kind of descent. And when that atmosphere was more guarded and cautioned than we are today, what has happened? What has happened that we so arrogantly and even boastfully judge in the magisterium, accuse it of heresy, and sit in judgment of it every day on Twitter, YouTube, Facebook, or whatever. It belongs intrinsically to the right attitude of faith of any Catholic seriously to strive to attach a positive value to even a provisional statement of doctrine on the part of the church and to make it its own. The German bishops are literally saying you need to church splain. You need to pope splain. You need to, whenever the church teaches something, you need to harmonize it with what it's previously taught. And you have a burden on your conscience to not only assent to the teaching, but to explain how it actually lines up with what the teaching of the church uh, is and has expressed elsewhere. Again, when the German bishops are having to tell you 
you need to pope splain and church splain and harmonize the hermeneutic, hermeneutic of continuity. Wow, we we've just really gone far. So when we judge ourselves today and compare ourselves to others in other decades or even centuries, we can start to get some perspective and realize how far we've really gone in our descent and how wild we've become, how arrogant we've become in sitting in judgment of the Pope, uh, accusing the magisterium of teaching heresy. Again, I am going to say over and over, you have multiple bishops signing a document saying the Pope teaches heresy and Desiderio Des Desiderabi and have never retracted their signature. If you look at the Eighth Ecumenical Council, um, you look at Canon 21 in the Acts of Canon 21. Um, well, in the translation of Father Richard Price in his translation of the Acts, when you go to his full translation of Canon 21, it even notes that just simply writing something, publishing something and writing, accusing the Pope of heresy is anathema. So not, not just sitting in judgment of him in a council, but literally just publishing something in writing saying the Pope is teaching heresy, that is anathema according to Canon 21 of the Eighth Ecumenical Council. And at the very least, that's still morally binding on us. I'm not making a canonical argument, but I'm just saying that canon is still morally binding on us. So again, let that sink in in a day and age where we write constantly that the Pope teaches heresy, you know, here and there. And this or that document. Um, <clears throat> let's see. Uh, by the way, thank you, Matthew uh, Smith, for that uh, super chat here. Let me grab this and see what he says here. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Let's see. Thanks for helping me understand it more so earlier. Keep up the better work. Oh, yeah, yeah. That was a great conversation we spoke uh, on Zoom earlier. Yeah, yeah. Hey, I'll tell y'all in the chat, um, Matthew is is very well versed in, in some of these areas, and so I have to commend him uh, for that. So um, I, I certainly look forward to seeing more comments from you, Matthew. I appreciate that discussion earlier. And, and again, thank you for that uh, super chat. Um, okay, so, um, well, is an, ana is an anathema an excommunicable offense? Yes. Now, again, I'm not making the argument that that canon still canonically applies, uh, but what I am saying is it morally, at the very least, it still morally applies because they not only were attaching canonical penalties, they were also saying this is morally something that sends you to hell. Uh, this is them, okay? This, I'm not making this up. This is the council fathers. They say effectively that you know, whoever heard of such a thing and, you know, a person sitting in judgment of the papacy, and they're not just talking about in a council, they're talking about just in writing. And they do go over the case of Honorius and explain in the case of Honorius, it was a pope judging another pope, which is the only exception to what they're saying. But they even note about how, you know, anybody who does this kind of thing will not inherit eternal life. So they see this as a damnable offense. So something we need to go to confession over if we're guilty of it. Um, but anyways, I want to point to a comment that Rahner makes after reviewing this document in his essay. Again, Rahner certainly has um, some issues, and so I'm not necessarily saying that um, he is a you know go-to guy or something in theology. Uh, there's, there's certainly some controversy surrounding him theologically. But I want to point out, even Rahner in his own day is no, noticing a, an issue that I notice even today. And this is back in the 60s that he's saying this. Listen to this. The real situation, however, is in fact this. Our present-day Catholic authoritarians are only too ready to uphold Pope and Bishop so long as they teach what they themselves regard as right. 
Otherwise, they dispense themselves from that very attitude of unconditional obedience to doctrine, which they defend indiscriminately against the modernists of today as a sacred principle. Man, okay. He's right about this. And it's interesting to see that he's addressing that phenomenon in his own day. And that's very timely for us today. Because it's as I've pointed out, even quoting Newman, who notes this in his own day, you have some people who will defend the magisterium only in so far as they agree with the magisterium. But as soon as the magisterium says something they don't agree with, instead of conforming themselves to what the magisterium teaches, they instead depart from it. But they expect others to assent to the magisterium, and they'll pull the magisterium card whenever they want to prove their doctrine. And so let me give you an example. People in Rahner's day would say, oh, you modernists are rejecting humane vitae. You're wrong. You're going against the teachings of the church. And yet, some of those same people were then dissenting against the teachings of the church elsewhere. Now, that sounds familiar because that's exactly what's taking place today. You have some people saying, hey, Father James Martin, you're wrong. You're dissenting against this teaching. But then some of those same critics will themselves dissent against magisterial teachings under this pontificate. So it's like, upon what basis can you critique Ron, um, uh, I say Ronner, uh, Father Martin, upon what basis can you critique him when you yourself are in dissent? You, you don't have a leg to stand on. If, if you too are dissenting against the magisterium, you can't call someone else out who is dissenting. So what's the solution? Well, to not dissent against the magisterium. Because, again, there's nothing in our faith that allows for us to do this publicly to begin with. And also it makes us hypocrites whenever we call out liberals for their dissent when we ourselves are dissenting against the faith and under the guise of tradition. So I just thought that is so interesting that this was a phenomenon that was going on even in Rahner's day. I thought, wow, um, that's actually very apropos for today. Uh, thank you for the super chat. Chris says, I don't know if you've spoken on it, but uh, what are your thoughts on the Pope saying uh, Israel is terrorizing? I don't know where to start and on all that I'm with neither. I haven't seen those comments. Um, if you can email that to me, reason and theology at gmail.com, I'd love to take a look at it. Um, I just I haven't seen those comments, so I can't I can't comment on that with any insight. I, I need to see what the Pope has said. Um, or if he's actually even said that. Can you define real modernism for the rad trads in the back? Yeah, I mean there's a lot of aspects to modernism, right? And so there's a lot of angles to this. Uh, but one key theme, I think, is that with the old school modernists, like your bona fide modernists, one one feature of them is that they'll say they hold to the dogmas of the church, but they'll redefine what those dogmas are. Kind of like some rad trads do today or pseudo-traditionalists. They'll redefine what indefectibility is, or they'll redefine what schism is. We see Bishop Schneider doing that in Credo. Uh, or your average pseudo-traditionalist doing that with indefectibility. They'll redefine these terms, but say they hold to them. Um, the, which is ironic because it kind of shows the pseudo-traditionalists are very much like the modernists. Um, now, again, the modernists would say, I believe in these dogmas, but they'll just redefine what the dogma means. Again, that's the same problem we have with some pseudo-traditionalists. People claim to be Catholic, claim to be traditional, but in fact, they're not traditional. They're departing from the traditional teachings of the church under the guise of tradition or in the name of tradition. Very much like what the modernists did. Now you have your more neo-modernists, and Karl Rahner, it's funny in this essay, actually says that people were calling him a neo-modernist. Uh, so that term was evidently even going on even then. Uh, <laughs> and uh, you, you have more neo-modernists today. Most, most people aren't bona fide modernists, uh, with the exception of some, some radical progressives and some pseudo-traditionalists. Most people aren't 
actual modernists. They're what I would call neo-modernists. And that is, they may not redefine the dogmas, uh, but perhaps they're very too, uh, they're, they're, they're very much um, into dissenting from the magisterium um, or redefining terms to, to a point that isn't um, accurate. Um, I guess that's, that's how I would define them, but distinguish them from the actual modernists would just completely redefine the terms. Uh, Neo-modernists would, would do so probably in a less, um, in a more mitigated fashion. You know, I, I don't know too many people out there who say, you know, I affirm the dogmas of the church, but just completely redefine what they mean. I can point to a few examples, but it's not as common as you would think. Um, of conflicts between magisterium and deposit of faith, unless the magisterium is limited by the deposit of faith, which is what seems to be. I don't know what that is. It looks like a uh, comment instead of question. Sorry. Um, okay. Some are saying Pope Francis is sick. Yeah, we certainly need to keep him in our prayers. Mm -hmm. Okay. I think I uh, maybe grabbed everything already there. Um, yeah, there's some good talks by William Marshner on modernism. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And he'll back up what I'm saying about redefining dogmas. Uh, his lectures will specifically back that up. And he goes into that in detail. What's my take on Burke? Are you referring to the recent rumors? Um, if they're, if you're referring to the recent rumors, to my knowledge, they're only rumors. So I'm not going to weigh in on that until we, um, we hear something more concrete and, you know, um, if, if you're referring to his like apartment and rent money and stuff like that, it, to my knowledge, it's just rumors. So, um, but hey, if I'm missing something and it's not just rumors and it's been confirmed, I mean, send it to me. I'd love to take a look. Um, reason and theology at gmail.com is where you can send it. Anyways, I don't know. I just wanted to chat with y'all about this on publicly, um, on the question of public dissent and uh, kind of point out some interesting things here from the German bishops, um, just because I think it should give us more perspective. Again, when the Germans are being more traditional than we're being, that should give us pause, <laughs> make us reevaluate re some things. <laughs> so, <laughs> all right, well, that's going to do it, y'all. Uh, I'll check in with y'all uh, either with another stream later on today or tomorrow. Uh, hey, hit that like button, hit the subscribe button if you want to support me. Definitely consider doing so, patreon.com forward slash reason and theology. That would be great. Um, I would, uh, truly appreciate the support. Um, and there's also a PayPal and a Patreon there in the show notes, uh, not PayPal. Uh, I'm sorry, not Patreon, uh, PayPal and GoFundMe in addition to the Patreon there in the show notes, if y'all want to support me through those, uh, but certainly hit that subscribe button if you haven't already and the like button, and certainly also leave a comment in the comment section. All right, y'all that's going to do it. See you later. Are you a Catholic thinking about converting to Eastern Orthodoxy? Or are you a Protestant discerning whether or not to become Catholic or Eastern Orthodox? If so, I have the book just for you. It's called Answering Orthodoxy and engages all of the arguments that Eastern Orthodox use against the Catholic Church. I respond to all of them. I show that they are in error and in fact they're inconsistent because the things that Orthodox are objecting to are in fact found in their own tradition. So the fullness of the faith can only be found in the Catholic Church. Check out the book right now at shop.catholic.com for your copy today.